I hope you left your skates outside this morning as you skated into worship. Welcome, daring, wonderful folk who dared to come out on this, this uh, uh, icy and snowy day. So a warm welcome to each of you. And in the name of the one who gathers us in and calls us each by name and, gives and shows us the love that encircles all love, it is in the name of that God that I welcome each and every one of you here this morning. A welcome to those who are our faithful viewers in TV land and East Link. A warm welcome to you as, uh, as you share with us in worship this morning. And if there are visitors here this morning, I want to assure you of a warm welcome. We're glad that you could be with us. After worship, there is uh, refreshments uh, down in the, in the gym. The, the Trinity is like a maze. And trying to find your way around is kind of kind of hard at times. Uh, but uh, there's always a little line of people that continue to make their way back. So uh, if you're new and you're not familiar with the, with the church, uh, grab, follow the crowd. Follow the crowd to the, to the gymnasium. There's also, um, if you're visiting with us, there's a guest book in the back of the church. Please sign your name. Let us know where you're from. And uh, if, you're, uh, if you're new and looking for a church and you want to... Uh, Kathy and I would be very pleased to meet with you and to, to uh, chat with you. As we gather this day as community, we hold in our thoughts and in our prayers uh, people who are experiencing loss, and we extend to Errol Andrews uh, on the death of his sister Doreen this past week, so our thoughts are with, certainly with the Andrews family and Errol. Uh, also to Florence Murray and her family on the death of her husband Howard. Florence and Howard were very much a part of this congregation for many, many years, and the funeral will take place this afternoon at 1 p.m. at Belvedere Funeral Home. Also extended, uh, uh, sympathy is extended to Shirley Pollard on the death of her sister this, uh, just yesterday, Dorothy Crosby. So to all those who are experiencing loss and death in their lives, our thoughts and then our prayers go out to all. On a happier note, uh, lots of birthdays. June must have been a pretty wild month, I think, to have so many birthdays. And Isabel Scott is uh, today, she's celebrating. She was dancing around downstairs and singing and smiling. And I said, my gosh, Isabel, must be your birthday. <laughs> uh, Barb Diel is the February 13th. Alice Pickett is celebrating on February 15th. And Judy Irwin down here is also celebrating on February 16th. And uh, Elaine McDonald on February 17th. So there's going to be lots of partying up here and uh, lots of celebrating. So happy birthday to each of you. And to those souls who keep your birthdays secret, happy birthday to you, whoever you are. This morning we are very gifted and very uh, privileged and very... Um, what? We're, we're very fortunate to have people who will share in worship and provide leadership. And this morning to Roma Down McCory, who's going to be sharing in our reading of Scripture this morning. Thank you. And Noah is our buddy there. He's lighting the candles, keeps the candles a burning for us. So it's good to have Noah with us to light the candles this morning. Minute for Mission this morning. Thank you to Catherine Dewar for the Church and History Archives and Val Down, who will be sharing with us the chair. Uh, she's the chair of the Affirm Committee as well. Our PowerPoint uh, was provided, uh, created by Annika Kelly, and uh, Mary Coppler smith is going to be our clicker this morning, so thank you. Next week we will be uh, celebrating our, an annual meeting of the church. We have that every year to look at the work we've done and, and those sorts of things and to look at the year ahead. And uh, there's a note in the bulletin regarding sandwiches and sweets and all that sort of stuff we've, because we can't have a meeting without a little bit of a snack, can we? Uh, and the storm date is the following week, the 25th. So please read that in your bulletin announcements. And because, the confirmation uh, because of the meeting next week, the confirmation class, which is to meet next week as well, will meet at 9 o'clock in the morning. We usually meet at 12 after church, so for next Sunday only, it'll be at 9 o'clock. Um, Kathy is going to be back tomorrow. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so we welcome Kathy back, and uh, I'm really looking forward to her coming back and, and uh, celebrating again. So it's good to have McCall back and uh, us uh, sharing in ministry once again. Mary Copper Smith passed along this announcement. Today at 1 p.m. there will be a gathering, Justice for Colton Bushy, at the back of the Coles Building on Richmond Street. The Council of Canadians and the UPEI Aboriginal Student Association invite you to come and show your support and solidarity for Colton Bushy's family and all Indigenous people in Canada after the acquittal of Saskatchewan farmer Gerald Stanley on Friday. So that's a meeting today at 1 p.m., a gathering um, uh, at the Coles Building on, uh, on Richmond Street. Norman, you're up. Good morning. Good morning. Now, I am in a pickle this morning, and I have to depend on you people to get me out of it. There's supposed to be a prime rib roast beef dinner here next Saturday at 5.30. But for some reason that we don't really understand for sure, the ticket sales have been very slow. And as of 10.15 this morning, we only had 50 sold. And we need more than that. We need in the 70s or 80s to make it a go. So anybody that's here this morning that haven't bought tickets and want to buy them, they'll be on sale after church at the Richmond Street entrance. Now, if for any reason we have to cancel, we will give notice on Tuesday. We know, we don't know the first 20 people who bought, but we pretty well know the rest. So we will phone the ones we know and we'll put it on the church website for general information. So those who bought early, you'll have to check. But look, we've been having these dinners for at least 10 years now, and this is the first time we've ever had any problem selling the tickets. And we have the chef, Emily Wells, who always does a great job so I encourage you to buy tickets. They're only $20. Where else could you get a prime rib roast beef dinner for $20? You just couldn't do it. And they're always, uh, everybody always enjoy themselves. So please come to my rescue because I don't want to be in a pickle too long. Thank you. <laughs> Norman, while I was thinking, we could put like a, get a jail or something and lock you in a jail up here, and then they're gonna until we get uh, the money. So, might be not good optics for a judge. <laughs> and good morning. The uh, every five years in the United Church of Canada, our clergy can apply to go on sabbatical. Greg's a little slow, but he did put a proposal in, what, nine years, ten years, into his ministry with us. Um, to, it, this is not a holiday time. It's a time of work and reflection. And there's a proposal that goes with it. The proposal is, Greg's proposal, includes a bibliography and everything, is 11 pages long. And we in the United Church tend not to want to waste paper. A paper copy is available, you just ask Ellen for it, but it is also on the website. And so if you go on to trindyclifton.org, far right side of the home page, what's happening, under church news is the full proposal. But again, if you would like to have it in paper, just ask. Thank you. Noah. You can come light our candle for us. <clears throat> Good 
as Noah lights this candle, it is a reminder to us, especially in this time of the year when there's lots of darkness, that in our darkness there is a light, and that light never goes out, the light of Christ. Let us take a few moments to, for quiet preparation for worship. Gathering in this sacred place, we anticipate new wonders each week. May our eyes witness the fantastic love and wondrous joy waiting to be revealed, even this day, even in this place. Our hymn is uh, number 296 in Voices United. This is God's wondrous world. And <clears throat> Please be seated. <clears throat> Let us gather our hearts and our minds and our thoughts. Let us pray. O Holy One, on the mountain tops and valley floors, you reveal to us the light of your love. Our hearts desire 
is to bask in your divine presence. With each encounter, we are changed, transformed, transfigured. Draw us nearer that we might receive a double portion of your spirit. Help us, O Holy One, to live our lives as a reflection of your divine love. May we walk among our brothers and sisters as a blessing, bringing light into dark places, hope into to displace despair, and love that casts out hate. And we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For our next hymn, I'd invite the congregation to remain seated. And uh, it, we'll sing the first two verses before our time with the children and the last two verses after our time with the children. Teach me, God, to wonder. Number 299. <clears throat> love that skippity hoppity jump walking. Could you do that for me again? Did you try that? I'm going to try that with you. Come on up and sh let's do that. How do we do that? You want to show us? There we go. There we go. There we go. Wow, that, I like that. You know, I think all the congregations should get up and do that. That would be really good. Thank you for doing that on the way up. That was great. Hi there. Excellent. That felt good. Did you? That, 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 I felt. I feel a lot better now since doing that. Thank you for sharing that. Well, it's really good to see you this morning. Everybody full of energy this morning. You are. Look at that big smile. I love your smile. Well, 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 well. <clears throat> I have something here. Well, I'm going to tell you a story first. It's a story that the. Big boys and girls are going to hear just a little later on. If you stay up and worship, you will hear it. Hi there. Come on up. <laughs> so the big boys and girls are going to hear this story. And it's about Jesus and some of his friends. And they go up on a mountain. And something happens, the story goes. It's kind of a strange story. Jesus starts glowing and gets all bright and shiny and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I know. It's a hard story, but it's a fun story as well. So, you know what we call this day, and you probably don't know what, you, what we call this particular Sunday. Transfiguration Sunday. Yeah. Whoa, that's a big word, isn't it? That's a churchy word. Transfiguration Sunday. Can you say that? Transfiguration. Yeah, exactly. Now, that's a, that's a really big and sort of a hard word to say, but it re all it really means to be transfigured is, to, is to, that we change. Anybody ever change? When you grow old, do you change? You change, you get 
Then what happens when you grow older? You get wrinkles. You get older. <laughs> you get wrinkles. You betcha. You've got to be. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Wrink you have less time to live. That's right. As we grow older, we have less time to live. You're right. But what other changes happen to, between, you know, the living? What sort of things happen when we grow older? Do we change, don't we? Mm -hmm. We could become a grandpa. Yep. Anything else? What else happens? Do we, as we grow older, who has their baby teeth? Or the teeth? Yeah. And who's losing some of their teeth? Me. You are. <laughs> That's right. So, and you're losing. Look, some coming in. That's right. Oh, wow. So those are some changes that happen. Now, that's things that happen to us in our bodies. Now, I want to show you some pictures here. Who likes these things? What are they? Caterpillars. Caterpillars. Do you like caterpillars? Yeah, I like You don't like caterpillars? Oh, you, oh you gotta, you're smart. You've got to wait. <laughs> you're jumping ahead of my story. <laughs> Yeah, look at that. So do they look? So the this is a pretty one. This is a pretty one, isn't it? Yeah. Notice how pretty they are. So, what about this here? Oh, oops. Oh, I jumped ahead here. What's this? A cocoon. A cocoon. So why would a cocoon, why would there be a cocoon? Oh, 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 what, where, where's the caterpillar sleeping? Okay, so who made the cocoon? The caterpillar maybe made a silken cocoon. Looks pretty cozy, doesn't it? That's why he has to get so fat. It's pretty small. And what's happening here? Oh, no, I don't think so. Cocoon. Ah, so there's, tr there's transfiguration happening, or transformation, or there's change. It's changing. It is freaky. You betcha. Look at that. And what's happening here? Oh, that looks like There we go. What do you think is happening here? Yeah? What do you think is happening? It's... Ah, look here. <gasps> and see all the colors? I think this pushing out of that cocoon. You bet you can see. And then, voila. Butterfly. That's pretty, isn't it? From, from this person or this little bug. To this bug. So that's right. So what 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 happened? Was there something? They changed. They changed. And you know what? You know what I was thinking. You know, as we grow older, we change. We get taller. We get pardon. Our voice changes. We get new teeth. <clears throat> we get taller, right? And so as we grow older, we do that. But you know what? As we learn about God, and as we learn about how God loves us and cares for us, we change here as well. We change inside. And we when we see how God loves us, then we love each other like God. So we all, we're, we're going to be changing. We're all going to change. And when we think about God, God's love, we will always, yes. That's, that's another change, birthdays, you betcha. 
So I've said, totally lost this story with you guys. So let's go. Have, we'll have a prayer. <laughs> Would you like to pray with me? Hi, God. Hi, God. Thank you for this day. Thank you for changes. And thank you for your love that helps change us to be kind to others. Talk to you later, God. Amen. Thank you so much. Anybody like those pictures? Would you like to take them down to school, Sunday school? <coughs> okay, let's. Okay, you could take. I'll take the freaky And we'll continue our singing. You take care. Okay. I think there might be. Yeah, you can have this one. Here we go. Do you want to give me five? Cool. See you later. Our first reading this morning is 2 Kings, uh, verses 1 to 12. Now when God was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for God has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As God lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to see Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today God will take your mentor away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for God has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as God lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today God will take your mentor away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here for God has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as God lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they were both standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water the water was parted to the one side and then to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I'm being taken from you, it will be granted, granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, 
he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Our second reading you'll find in Voices United. It's Psalm 50, um, verses 1 to 6. And maybe, Don, you could play the sung response for us, please. God the Almighty has spoken. God shines out from Zion, a city perfect in beauty. Before you, God, runs a consuming fire and a mighty tempest rage about you. You call on the heavens above. Gather my people before me, the people who made covenant with me by sacrifice. A reading from Mark. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my child, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked round, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of God had risen from the dead. May God's richest blessing be upon these portions read from Holy Scripture, and may God's name be described all honor and glory and praise this day and forevermore. Amen. <clears throat>
Let us pray. Gracious and Holy One, we bring this day who we are. We bring this day our thoughts and our fears. We bring this day our total person. We open ourselves to you. May the brief words that I am to speak, O God, may it find a place in our hearts and minds that you might take and mold. We ask, O God, that the words that I speak, thoughts in our hearts, in our whole lives, might be oriented towards your love and your care for all. Amen. <clears throat> if you've been around the church for any length of time, or I, I, if you're like me, I can only remember, and I sometimes can't even remember the sermon last week, even when I preach it. So, um, but if you've been around the church for any length of time, and you have really good memories, then you will note that every time uh, as we move from um, uh, Epiphany to Lent, we have Transfiguration Sunday, and we have the story that, was, that I shared with you from the Gospels. Each year, it is like a bridge as we go from Epiphany to Lent, and uh, this story will, is repeated often. It's one of the stories that's found in all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In the, the, we call it synoptic Gospels, and synoptic simply means three. So in the three Gospels, we have this common story, albeit some more embellished than others. Now, I think you will agree with me, it's a bit of a crazy story, don't you think? It's a little, not something we see very often, uh, those sorts of things happening. I've never ever seen it. And it's even crazier when the preacher has to go and uh, wrestle with the story and sort of talk intelligibly, intelligibly about, uh, about what's happening. My temptation, like many preachers, is to try and explain the story, to get into it and to, to really explain what's going on. Uh, what happened on the mountain when Jesus went to pray with Peter, James, and John. Want to could be looking at why Jesus' clothes became dazzling white. And as Mark says, or the writer of Mark says, there's not enough bleach in the world to go and make it whiter than it was. Or how could Moses and Elijah, who's been dead for so long, how could they sort of appear and have a conversation with Jesus? And how could a voice open up from the clouds and speak, there is my child, listen to him? We could look at it and say, well, it's kind of a crazy dream. Maybe it's a dream, hallucinating. You have probably seen it all, a struggling preacher up here trying to convince you that this story is real, literal, and inviting you to defile all that you know about reason and put reason on hold. Once we move into trying to mix science and story or literature together as if they are the same, I think we lose most of the practical transformative power of the gospel. When we try to make the gospel into some type of science. So I'm going to spare you the mental gymnastics this morning and I'm going to allow you to bring in your reason, to not put it outside, because I respect each of us as we journey and as we struggle with things and as we question and as we grapple with it. I'm not going to try to prove that this story is literal in any way, that it actually happened, as is written. I'm going to treat the story like Harry Potter's, or the author of Harry Potter, seeing it as a story but with some learning that we can take away and that we can be a transforming force within our world against all those things and all those forces that would limit God's love and care for all people. It's interesting to note, just as an aside, that it's in, Mar in Mark's gospel, we do not have an account 
at the end of the resurrection story. It's not there. There's no account of the resurrection. Nothing. So some scholars have suggested that the story that was read, the transfiguration story, is really Mark's resurrection story. Transfiguration literally means to change figure or form. All great religions of the world emerged out of some encounter with God or a deity that radically changed their lives of those who encountered the holy. Something happened. Something changed them. Something reoriented their lives to something that was greater and magnificent and very, very real and oftentimes not able to explain. They were transfigured and their experiences gave birth to the faith traditions we celebrate today. Transfiguration comes in many ways, both dynamic and gradual, and begs the question, what is the transfigured life? What does it mean to be a transfigured congregation or community of faith? What does it mean to move out into the world as a transfigured people? What does it look like? The story today invites us to see our world in a Celtic understanding of thin places. Thin places where the presence of love, where the presence of respect, where the presence of value, uh, a value of people, are realized fully, strongly, and authentically, and that presence comes close. And that presence is, I believe, of God. It doesn't require us, though, to explain or define it, slap it into a book and cement it up for eternity, and say, this is what it means, and that's it. It simply invites us to be in the presence of. Being in the presence doesn't mean that, that, um, that we are unchanged. To the contrary, we are changed. We are transfigured. We can't be the same people we were before. Historically, mountaintops were seen as places of revelation. <clears throat> And for primitive cultures who understood the world in layers, there was that which was up here, which was bright and sunny and nice. In the nighttime there were stars, but also there were times of stormy times as well. That was the place of the gods. Right below in the earth that was dark and cold and all that sort of stuff, and where creepy bugs and things were, and where when people died, that's where they went, that was the place of the dead. And then in between, in between we have this place where humans moved and did their things and celebrated life and all those sorts of things. So given that type of thinking, it was not uncommon, actually it was very common to see people going to the mountaintops, which would have put you closer to the heavens, closer to God, closer to the deity. So it was easy to think that the mountaintops brought you closer to, to the gods or, the, or God. Mountaintops were literally, figuratively, and spiritually closer to the heavens than the valleys. And in a practical sense, mountains are places of perspective and vision far out beyond the horizon. I remember some years ago, uh, I climbed up Grossmorn Mountain, which is in Newfoundland, and it's the second highest mountain in Newfoundland, many years ago. I don't know if I could do it now, but I can still remember climbing up the face of that, going up that mountain, and stopping as I went up and taking a, bre a, a break and a breath, and looking out over all that was out beyond, looking out over the sea, the other valleys, and all that sort of stuff, and continued to climb up until we got up at the summit of that mountain and looked out over all as far as the eye could see. It was beautiful. It gave a whole different perspective of what was lying out there. It gave a different view of the land, a different perspective, a different vision. From the mountaintop you can see further 
and know more about what is around you. The times when we experience those thin moments in our lives when God comes close to us and when we come close to God can be times of great vision such as we have on the mountains those close moments of, of that experience of the holy and being able to look beyond ourself and see a world that's different or a world that could be or a kingdom of which Jesus spoke. Mountaintop experiences. And it seems to me that the story of Jesus' transfiguration, however, whatever happened there, speaks more about us and our journey than about Jesus' journey. It invites us to examine our stories, our visions, our encounters with God. The story invites us to look for more in ourselves, to look for more in our world. It pushes us to realize the holy is not contained in one place or one religion or one group, whether rich or poor or whatever, which we are prone to do, but to realize that God is greater than we think, greater than the Christian religion thinks, greater than the Hindu religion thinks, greater than the Muslim religion thinks, greater than any religious organization thinks, greater than atheism thinks. As great religions of the world emerge out of some encounter with God that radically change their lives, it is the encounters of God in our lives, in our church, that will move us out to be a transformative presence in the world. In Mark's story, the disciples rightly wanted to stay on the mountaintop. Whenever we have those mountaintop experiences, we don't want to come back down. It's a reality. It's a good place. We enjoy it. We want to keep the moment, we want to savor the moment. And yet the moments are savored. Those mountaintop experiences still reside somewhere in the psyche and in the brain that continues to come and bubble up to make us better people than who, who we were before. The mountaintop experience for me, when I think back to Grossmorn Mountain, for instance, I can still close my eyes and see very clearly as I went up that mountain and what I saw beyond. That's still with me. And those thin moments of God that challenged me, that pushed me, that prodded me, and also the, the ways in which God has moved and prodded and pushed each of us here and the church as a whole, still is part of the DNA still is a part of who we are that needs to push out and still become the people that God calls us to be. As a church, as a faith-filled people, we move from prayer to protest, from meditation to movement, from mountaintops to valleys, with vision, with faith, with an openness that God is not a God that stays still, but a God that changes, and we're part of that change. We're part of that moving forward, and we're invited to be part of that with the God whom we worship. We become instruments as we become transformed. We become open as we allow God to speak to our minds and our hearts. We become fearless when we stand up and we voice our words, and we walk the faith, and we live the life that God has given to us. In that way, we are transformed. But more importantly, it's not just you, me, a selfish, transformed people. We are transformative. We go forth with a change in our lives, and we move out into the world in the name of our God and continue to be that change that brings life that brings strength, that brings hope, that brings God of life and love into all the world. That's our mission. That's our reason. That's our vision. May we go forth fully knowing the presence and the love of God that enfolds our life this day. Amen. At this time, let us take just a few moments of quiet meditation as Don shares with us uh, uh, some music and uh, after the music uh, we will proceed with our Minute for Mission and History and Archives presentation.
Good morning. The mandate, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Catherine Dewar, Chair of the History and Archives Committee. Can everybody hear me? Okay. The mandate of the History and Archives Committee is twofold. Number one is to manage the organization, preservation, and proper distribution of the contents of the Trend United Church archives according to the United Church guidelines. The archives houses records dating back to the early 1800s, such as minutes, birth, death, marriage registers, annual reports, bulletins, correspondence, pictures, old sermons, architectural plans, deeds, land records, and a large photo collection, as well as old artifacts and many old theological books. Now, the organization of the archives was um, done by Kelty McPhail, who has a master's in library science, and she was hired with funds external to our church budget. She transformed the room full of boxes into a first-rate archives, producing an index that provides the location of each item in the archives. So this is in there. If you look at this index, you'll find anything you want to find. Now, in terms of preservation, in conjunction with UPEI, a digitized uh, project was carried out. Hard copies of all our old records were made. A digital version was uploaded to the website. And uh, 37 volumes of old, um, beautifully bound leather volumes were transferred to the Maritime Conference. Um, in terms of distribution, other documents are trans uh, transferred to the Maritime Conference archives on a regular basis, such as um, bulletins, uh, minutes, reports, etc. We also function as a resource to the clergy, to committees, the congregation, and to the public at large. Now, uh, we also have an historical mandate and that is to increase the knowledge of the church history to the congregation and to the public in general. Um, in terms, we do research and promotion. Research on the church history has been done by Reg Porter, Nathan Mayer, Kelty McPhail, and Catherine Dewar. A research source for tour guides has been produced. Reg Porter published a booklet on the stained glass windows of the church. Some of you have that. Catherine Doerr and Kelty McPhail inventoried and photographed all, all the um, artifacts, the memorial artifacts in the church, and we produced a booklet that looked like this. It's available for anybody to see. And Catherine Doerr published an article in the Beacon Magazine on the church. Reg Porter has just completed four book chapters which can be used in a history if and when the church history gets produced. Assisted, um, and we also as assist in special projects that get um, advertised in the press. So that is our history and archives mandate. And I'll call on Valerie now. Thank you, Catherine. Some amazing work. Trinity Clifton became uh, pastoral charge, voted to become an affirming ministry on the 6th of December, 2015, the first affirming ministry on PEI. The Affirm Steering Committee is an ad hoc committee reporting directly to church council. This initiative has been very positive in the life and the work of the, our church. Committee members are myself, June Jenkins Sanderson, Jane Farkison, Reverend Ian McLean, and Caridwin Campbell. Book club facilitators are Bev Bishop and Monica McDonald. A more complete outline of our work is included in the annual report, but today I'd like to briefly highlight a few of the visible things in the committee's action plan this past year. The Affirm United logo appears on all signage. Signage was coordinated with the Communications and Property Committees for the new gender-neutral washrooms. The book club meets three times a year 
to explore social justice issues through reading and dialogue. On June 25th, we celebrated diversity in our worship service in conjunction with the Diversity Multicultural Festival. We've hosted a supper club speaker on the use of language and how it affects diversity. And for the second year, Trinity Clifton has hosted the PEI Pride Week service and Trinity's banner was carried by congregation members in the Pride Parade. Don Scott, Chair of Outreach, received a recognition citation and, M and PIN from MP Sean Casey for his work with the firm for promoting diversity and inclusion in the community. Do we have the vision statement? Do you have the, no. Okay, I'd like to read the vision statement that, that was created and adopted by this congregation on the 24th of May, 9, 2016. We, the Trinity Clifton Christian family, believe that God has blessed us with diversity, including diversity in sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, race, age, ability, and faith. We believe that Jesus challenged boundaries by reaching out to all people, welcoming and honoring all in their uniqueness. We publicly declare our commitment to openness, growth, action, and education honoring diversity and challenging injustice in solidarity with those who experience discrimination. We offer our resources and talents with open hands and hearts in love and service to all as we work for reconciliation and justice locally, regionally, and globally. Thank you. I'll give it back to Kat. Well, hello again. I'm still Catherine Doerr, and I'm still the chair of the History and the Archives Committee. And with me is Emily Bryant, who is our very great secretary, and she's going to assist me. Um, in the spirit of honoring the soul of the church and Heritage Week, the History and Archives Committee has three announcements to make. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Emily for the first one. And this is a good news announcement. The History and Archives Committee decided that we would um, reach for ways to recognize Trinity United Church by submitting a nomination to the Honoring Our Heritage program that has been launched by the National United Church of Canada Archives Committee. So in early 2017, as it was the 150th birthday of our nation, Canada, we nominated the historic Trinity United Church using the significant fact that this magnificent structure was there when the Fathers of Confederation met in Charlottetown for the first meeting that ended up being the nation's, being a nation. So it took a while, but on um, December the 6th, our nomination was honored, and on the website from the um, United Church of Canada archives, you will find the write-up and a picture of Trinity United Church. We have requested a tangible um, recognition so that everyone can see it, but we haven't received that, and at this point, it's only an online presence. Calista has linked the website with this article to the Trinity's website so that it's easy for people to find it when they're looking for it online. To date in this new program, there have been only a few nominations and most of them have been from people. There is the first um, church, Methodist church, that has been honored there at um, Hay Bale in Ontario but Trinity United Church is the first church to be recognized through this heritage program, and we think that's pretty special. Thank you, Emily. Um, the second announcement I have to make is today we're unveiling historical 
picture gallery. We think it's fitting to do it in Heritage Month on PEI. And as you leave today, look to the left and the right in the narthex, and you will see uh, pictures. On the right, it's the evolution of the Methodist Church on PEI. And on the left, you'll see the Trinity Clifton Church. This is where Methodism began in PEI. This is Benjamin's cha Benjamin Chapel's little house that was built sometime in the late 1700s, and it was located in Water Street. If you go out the front door, turn left, turn right on water, the second lot in is where this little house was. He was also the postmaster, and he got together a few people, and there started the Methodist Church and PEI. He did get discouraged at times, and he wrote to John Wesley saying, you only had two or three people, and I'm sorry I didn't bring my quote from um, the Bible. It's Wesley says, where two are gathered in my presence, there I, I am in the midst. I'm paraphrasing, I'm sorry. So now, the first resident minister on PEI, that's one who lived here, came in 19, uh, 1807, and it was Reverend Bulpit. We have a stained glass window in his honor. Now, he didn't have a church when he got here, so he applied to the Anglican clergy, who was Theophilus Desperse, to use the Anglican church. And that little church that you see down there is where he had his first church services. And that is in um, uh, Queen Square, and it's located where the Confederation building is now. So by 19, uh, 1811, they built a new courthouse, a new uh, legislative building on Queen Square. And at that point, again, Reverend Bullfoot asked to use that, and that's where they had their church services. And by 1810, they were getting a few more people. They wanted to have a little church of their own, and there was land um, conveyed to them. And um, it took a while, but they eventually got a church built. And here is a map of Charlottetown, 1833, that shows uh, the corner of Queen and Richmond. And you'll see a chapel, and you'll see a mission house there. I hope you can see them. And that was the first Methodist church on PEI. And it's located sort of where the uh, food, food bank is now or the food kitchen, I guess. And the mission house was Reverend Bulpit's um, home, and that's where his wife started the first school in PEI. She taught for 42 years. And then they were getting more people and more money, and they wanted their own church, so they commissioned Isaac Smith, who also uh, built the province house, to design a church. And this, is, this church was built in 1835 and was located just out here, just to the right of this church. And it served until 1864 when we started to build a new church. And you can see it going up there. And to the left, you see the old church still in place. And here is the new church. By 1873, they've got this magnificent manse built beside it, an Italianate architecture. The building that most resembles it today in Charlottetown is the Bishop's Palace next to the Basilica. The other thing you should note is how high the towers were on the church. They were a whole story higher than what they are now. So, Mr. Hartz died, um, I'm not sure, 18, 1907 or 8 left quite a bit of money to build a church hall <clears throat> that became known as Hart's Hall. And um, they couldn't find a place to put it, so they tore down the manse and built Hart's Hall. Uh, the other thing you'll note, look at the towers on the church. They look like a Norman fort. So this, this building, Hart's Hall, was there until 1969, and it burnt down. And by 1971, it was leveled, and you see now it's just the land. And here's uh, the present-day church. 
Now also, as part of the pastoral charge, is the little Clifton Church in Bunbury, and it was built in 1848, and it's been in almost continuous use since that time. It's one of the oldest united churches in Canada. And in 1962, it became part of the, our pastoral charge. And here's a bit more up-to-date picture. You see it hasn't changed much. So I'm hoping today when you leave, you'll go out and look at the picture gallery in the narthex. It's a little bit of our history, and uh, we hope you enjoy this. Now we've got one more thing to announce. Um, we thought it was fitting in this week, uh, Heritage Week, we're, we're making a donation to the Museum and Heritage Foundation of Benjamin Chapel's wallet, purse, we're not sure what to call it. Inside it says 1799, very old. So it's a very important artifact to the United Church and to the history of Prince Edward Island. We're also donating this um, sketch. It's an original sketch of the Methodist Church that was just out here done by C.V. Chapel, who was the grandson of Benjamin, and he was an architect. So this will be going to the provincial archives. So thank you very much. I hope we haven't overextended our time. Nobody's hitting me across the head back here. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and by the way, we'll take the artifacts to coffee and conversation if you want to have a closer look at them. And I also want to thank Mario Saruni, sitting in the front row, row, who installed all those pictures at the, uh, in the narthex of the church. Done very professionally and exacting, I can tell you very much. Thank you, Mario. And thank you for both presentations this morning. And uh, I think what jumped out at me was a sense of vision. Uh, of this, the people who began this church and uh, the community of the Methodist tradition here in Charlottetown. Peter offered to build a tabernacle on the mountain with Jesus, but God does not dwell in houses made with human hands. Let us offer ourselves in service to all. Let us offer our sacrifices to build community, bring peace, and to be a do double blessing to those in need throughout the world. We give as we are able. We give as we are called. Your morning offering will now be received. <clears throat>
And together we pray, God, you heap your love upon us like a parent providing for a family's needs, embracing a child with tenderness. Give us enough trust to live secure in your love and to share it freely with others in open-handed confidence that your love will never run out. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Visionary God who leads us, who leads us into places we would not normally go. O visionary God who gives to us new visions, gives to us a sense of purpose, gives to us a sense of justice, gives to us a voice to speak against the injustices that are present today. Oh God, there are many places where your voices need to be heard. Today we hold up the voices, O oh God, of your Spirit, the Creator, that needs to be heard within Canada, within the world, in relationships with our First Nations people, our Aboriginal people, with our voices who stand with our GBLTQ community, our voices, O oh God, who speak out for justice against the unlavished amount of, of war happening and the money's going to support such things while people in nations suffer and die. Where poverty in first world nations exists. Give us a voice, O oh God, to speak loudly. Give us a vision as a church and as a community to speak strongly and speak in your name against such injustice. Let us get angry. Let us get upset. Let us march for what is right. We know, O oh God, you who are always with us, you are the one who gives us strength and hope and life. And you are the one who wills that for all people. Help us, O oh God, go forth from here to be your feet and your hands. A word of hope for the hopeless. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our concluding hymn is number 150 and more voices, Spirit God, Be Our Breath. In the coming week, 
May you experience the presence of God with joy. May the holy cloud comfort you. May the divine voice encourage you. May the power of the Spirit transform you, transform us, transform our world. Go forth in peace. Go forth in the name of our God. Amen.